Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you, sir. We're good, Marie, thank you. Jason, do you need um, the, the video to be on? Um, ideally, yes, but if Moby is, is camera shy, I'm happy to uh, for him to hide behind his name. <laughs> um, but yeah, entirely up to him. Uh, he, it is, after all, his his show. Um, Katja, are you going to record um, and then send to me post? Yes, right? I will. Okay. I will be. That's awesome. Yeah, so it, it's it's not even an issue so much of... Recording in progress. Camera shy. It's... I turned off my cameras after watching season one of Mr. Robot. And so it's just, I've got, actually got tape over my cameras because I became paranoid after <laughs> season one of Mr. Robot. I don't, so I don't blame you not at all. That there's anything, not that there's ever anything interesting going on in my house, but at the very <laughs> least I thought I'd sort of protect myself and that was a few years ago, and so I, I could find a different device and turn on the camera, but that might in, take in, take up too much time. Not, not at all. Now, yeah, let's crack on, because I know you're the busiest man in, um, in what we call it, in music at the moment, and congratulations on, on Reprise. I think uh, I'm hoping you've heard that more than 100 times this week. Uh, I have not heard it much this week week um but it's nice to hear and also i quite a while ago decided to stop reading reviews um and to stop i, I basically about 10 years ago decided to stop reading any press that i do i don't, don't read reviews i don't watch myself on television mm. because i like to be sort of blissfully unaware of how i'm perceived publicly hmm. um because they're two the the double-edged terrible sword of public perception is when it's good it fuels my ego hmm. and when it's bad it makes me want to blow my brains out <laughs> so we don't, we don't there's want really lesson. no hmm. yeah there's no upside for me to ever pay attention to how i'm perceived publicly i'd much rather just sort of i don't know go hiking and play piano yeah which is which i if i were you i would do exactly the same thing but uh no it's it i think it's uh you know th that seems to echo throughout your career and i think reprise is an interesting uh, moment i'm sure for you kind of considering you know the journey of the last 30 years and uh you know and a lot has happened um and you know just from you know from the journey that you've had from you know, from being an unknown to becoming obviously world famous in everything that I've kind of read about you over the years. And I've been doing this for about as long as you've been in music is <clears throat> it's, it's been an, a, a weird kind of struggle, like a love hate relationship that you have with, you know, as you're saying, you don't read your own reviews. Um, you know, fame is something that you never sought, but then it, ca you know, then it happened. And then you, you kind of carried on that road and you didn't, you didn't divorce yourself from the process. And for a period of time, it was entirely unhealthy for you, but yet you you stayed in it. And I'm very curious as to why you didn't disengage, why you didn't go hiking and sort of uh, leave the space that was kind of toxic at a time. Well, part of it is, if I'm being honest, that um, I'm still sort of stunned and fascinated by the fact that I've ended up being a, a quasi public figure because when I was really, really young, not even really young, but like when I was in my teens, early twenties, you know, I was playing in punk rock bands. I was DJing to five people a night in a dive bar and I was living in an abandoned factory. Mm. You know, I had no running water. I had no bathroom and I was making around $2,000 a year. And I really never for a second thought that I would ever make music that anyone would listen to. Mm. You know, I mean, the, my, my, the punk rock band I was in, the first show we played out of state, out of, you know, we went to Ohio and we played a punk rock show in a pizza parlor and there were more people in the bands than were in the audience. <laughs> and that's, so musically, that's the world I come from. And I never, I mean, so like every tiny or large aspect of public figure 
music stuff that I've done has been baffling and surprising. And I'm still sort of intrigued by it. And I would say on a more, hopefully slightly more at the risk of again, being sort of, you know, maybe it's, I mean, this might sound very self aggrandizing, but I think that there's a potential for noble action. And what I mean by that is I'm not, I don't think I'm doing anything noble, but having an audience is unique mm. and I don't want to squander that, nor do I want to use that self-servingly. Mm. You know, I think that on one hand, having an audience is remarkable because people are at times willing to listen to the music that I've made. And I, I take that pretty seriously. Like I want to, if someone's going to invite me into their home, into their personal life, mm. I want to create something emotional and respectful of their time and attention. Mm. And then the other aspect, sorry for rambling on, no, but the other aspect is the, you know, having an audience enables me to draw attention, draw people's attention to issues that I think are important. Mm. Mm. So that's why, I mean, cause yeah, there, there are times when I've wanted to just sort of like lock the door and go for a hike and not come back. Mm. But I do sort of appreciate, you know, the idea of working on a daily basis and trying to work in a respectful way that has integrity, mm. even if at times it seems fruitless or frustrating. Mm. Mm. Because I mean, you have been prolific, obviously, throughout your career, um, even when you weren't necessarily making kind of number one records, you've <clears throat> obviously dabbled in a number of areas. And as you say, the, the interesting thing is <clears throat> any, any musician obviously has ambitions of becoming famous. And in, and, and in, in, your, in your case, you, you wanted to, it sounded like to me that you wanted to make just enough money to be able to do the thing that you loved and not necessarily become you know, this, this global phenomenon that you, you know, that you and your music uh, will certainly that reprise represents actually quite, uh, you know, very well in a very different way. Uh, yeah, I mean, that aspect of things, it, you know, I mean, there, there are a bunch of, from my perspective, a bunch of different facets to that. Mm. Um, and one is, I guess, the, the extent to which any part of my life has involved planning or intention. Mm. Um, and the truth is none of it has, mm. uh, like there was never much of an effort on my part to plan anything or to, to have a strategy around things. And whenever I've tried to have a strategy, the universe just slaps me in the back of the head and says, <laughs> like, what are, you know, what absurdity is this? Um, and then, so there's this, this sort of the lack of planning and lack of intention, but then there's also the lack of possibility, meaning when I was, as I sort of mentioned before, when I was growing up, I never thought that having a career as a musician or making money or having any of these things, I didn't even think they existed even remotely in the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I really thought that my existence you know, it was going to be spent playing obscure music that no one ever listened to. And at some point getting my doctorate in philosophy and becoming a philosophy professor. Like that's how I sort of thought my life was going to go. Mm. And it's still very confusing to me and, and kind of interesting that, that, that isn't how things worked out. Mm. And interesting that you say that because, you know, with, with Deutsche Grammophon, obviously, uh, approaching you and then obviously orchestrating uh, <clears throat> to use <laughs> to use the the term um, orchestrated the, the creation of what reprise has become um, and so they kind of got on with the admin they did all of the kind of the backroom stuff and allowed you to go away and create the parts that you did um, and as you say if, if you had instigated that, the universe would have colluded otherwise. So you've been fortunate in your career to have a wonderful kind of network around you that that freed you up to do the thing, you know, to, to stay true to your intention, I suppose. Uh, I mean, that, that old expression of, 
you know, fortune favors the well prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if I'm well prepared, but I, you know, I have a combination of like a good work ethic and quite a lot of experience and a deep love for what I do. Hmm. So, for example, when Deutsche Gramophone approached me to make this record, I realized that like making an orchestral album with a gospel choir and a ton of different singers was logistically going to be very challenging. Hmm. Um, but, you know, and I do sort of wish that <laughs> <laughs> I had the professional structure that you're talking about where I could just be like a whimsical, you know, I don't know, I was going to say like D.H. Lawrence or, hmm. you know, Lord Byron, just like <laughs> wandering around having creative flights of fancy. But like, I am also an uptight wasp from Connecticut so I get way too involved in the logistics and the mechanics of making things Um, which for an album like this because there are so many moving parts as opposed to normally how I make music is I'm alone in my studio just Mm. by myself working on music and logistically it's really easy but this logistically was so challenging Um, so clearly Deutsche Gramophone were wonderful in helping but like boy oh boy it was a lot of work trying to get all these people involved. But then yet again, you didn't go to Budapest. You didn't, you know, you, you, you decided to not get involved at that level, which is quite interesting. Well, largely because I'd already done the arrangements. Yeah. And I, so I had I'd worked with an orchestra once before in a studio um, and it was for one of the Jason Bourne movies. Hmm. And so I had done my orchestral, I, I wrote my orchestral parts and I handed them over to an orchestrator who turned them into score for the orchestra. And then the score was handed to the conductor and handed to the orchestra. Hmm. And I sat in the control room and I listened. Hmm. Because at that point, you know, I didn't, like, I don't have the experience to walk into a giant studio and talk to 130 people playing classical instruments and give them directions. Like, I'd already done my job, and so there I was sitting on this, you know, like, old black leather couch in a Sony studio while the conductor recorded the orchestra. Mm. And I realized if I went to Hungary, I'd be doing the exact same thing. So I just had that ostensibly self-evident realization that I didn't need to fly 9,000 miles to sit on a bad leather couch in a control room and listen when, you know, listen through two speakers when I could just stay home and listen through two speakers Mm. and, you know, send comments through virtually. Sure. My last question to you, Moby, is of all the tracks that landed up on the album, besides the wonderful cast that, uh, that performed on it, um, is there one track that kind of surprised you in a way that uh, you hadn't heard it before or perhaps it, it, it realized in this iteration um, quite extraordinarily well for you? Well, the tracks, it really, for me, I mean, and self-involvedly and with no objectivity, I, of course, really like and love the music on this record, mm. um, which maybe musicians are not supposed to admit that, but in this case, like, I really... I think the music on reprise, if I'm being honest, I love it. Mm. But the song that really surprised me and that I'm actually most grateful for its inclusion on the record is The Lonely Night with Chris Christopherson and Mm. Mark Lanigan. Mm. Mm. Because the original version was an incredibly quiet, obscure song at the end of an obscure album. And so it's safe to say that, you know, like you could count the number of people who've heard the original version probably on two hands. <laughs> and so somehow having Chris Christopherson's willingness to sing it, and he brought this emotional poignancy and gravitas to it. And I'm really glad that, you know, by orchestrating it, by re-recording all the elements, that I was able to draw attention to this song because it's, you know, lyrically compositionally in terms of the arrangement like I just I feel like it's there's something really special about it and Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled and when I say special I'm almost in a way 
pointing to the things that I had nothing to do with, like <laughs> Mark Lanigan and Chris Christofferson. Um, you keep good so, company, sir. So I think combined, uh, you're doing extraordinary work. Um, I would love to talk to you all day, sir, but um, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And congratulations again on an extraordinary body of work, not only reprise and uh, and, and all the very, very best with uh, what's to follow. I'm, I'm very keen to see what the next chapter looks like. Oh, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, sir. Good. Bye. Bye-bye.